بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الكريم سيدنا محمد النبي الامين وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا The next minor sign of day judgment is the spread of peace. And the spread of peace and the spread of fitna are mentioned in the same hadith so we can extract that that these will happen at different times. Um, during the early days of Mecca, when the Muslims were being tortured, one of the Sahaba, his name was Khabab ibn al-Arad radiallahu an, he was tortured by having hot coal put on his back. And this happened to him and he, uh, obviously he suffered from it. And he said in a hadith that is narrated in Bukhari, he said that we complained to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was leaning uh, in the shade of the Kaaba. And we said to him, won't you give us victory? Won't you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us victory? And the Prophet sallallahu like I said, he was leaning in the shade of the Kaaba. He sat straight and anger was apparent on his face. And he said, the ones who came before you were put into the ground and they brought a saw and they put it on top of their head and they started cutting them into two pieces while they were still alive and this believer would not give up their faith and they would bring another Muslim and they would comb him with combs of iron until they separated the flesh from the bones and the person would still not give up their religion and the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Wallahi la yutamanna hadha al-amr hatta yusiru al-raqibu min san'a ila hadra mawt la yakhafu illa Allah aw al-dhibu ala ghanamihi walakinnakum tasta'ajilun. He said, by Allah, this matter, al-Islam, it will not be complete until a rider, until a single rider will ride from San'a to Hadramaut, two points in Al Yemen. And this was known at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu to be a very, very dangerous road for even a caravan, a group of people, let alone a single rider who was vulnerable to attack. So the Prophet Sallallahu here is saying that this, this matter will not come to an end until a single rider will ride from Sana'a to Hadramaut fearing no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a wolf on its flock. But you are a people who are in a hurry. SubhanAllah, we're in a hurry. We are always waiting for the end result. We're always pushing for the result. We're result oriented. We forget that it is not about the result, that it is in fact about the effort that we put in. That is what we're going to be asked about. There's another incident with a man named Uday ibn Hatim. He became Muslim, but before he was Muslim, he was a Christian, and he came to visit the Prophet ﷺ. And he came from an Arab tribe that was a, a very troublesome tribe. Their tribe was actually, they used to raid caravans and raid people. Like that was their nine to five job. Their job was raiding people. They were gangs in the desert. That's what they did. And he, like I said, was a Christian and he was wearing a cross. And he approached the Prophet Sallallahu And when the Rasul Sallallahu saw the cross, uh, that, in, that instigated a conversation between them. And while they were talking, some of the poor and weaker Muslims came to the Prophet Sallallahu and asked him for help. This is when the Muslims were, you know, very, very troubling times. Things were very, very difficult. They were being persecuted. They were being exposed everywhere they went. It was very difficult. And while this was happening, or they uh, was seeing these weak Muslims approach the Prophet Sallallahu And so he was thinking to himself that maybe this faith that Muhammad is preaching is not for him. You know, maybe it is for, meant for weak people. 
It's not meant for him. And, and so the Prophet وسلم, he told him, فَقَالَ يَا عُدَيْ هَلْ رَأَيْتَ الْحِيرَ قُلْتُ لَمْ أَرَاهَا وَقَدْ أَنْبَتُهَا عَنْهَا that have you, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked Uday, he said, have you seen Al-Hira? And Uday responded, he said, I did not see it, but I know of it. So he said, قَالَ فَإِن طَالَتْ بِكَ حَيَاتْ لَتَرِيَنَّ الضَّعِينَ تَرْتَحُ لَا مِنَ الْحِيرَ حَتَّى تَطُوفَ بِالْكَعْبَةِ لَا تَخَافُ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ He said that if you live long enough to see it, you will see a woman traveling by herself from Al-Hira until she makes tawaf around the Kaaba, not fearing anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, and Uday continues in the narration, he thought to himself, well, what about the burglars of Tayy who have burned the countryside? You know, he knew about these people that they were in that area, in Al-Hira, and they caused havoc and, and, and pillage and corruption and it just really made things hard for people there. He thought that to himself. Time passes, and Uday himself witnessed the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, "Qala Uday, فرأيت الضعينة ترتحل من الحيرة حتى تطوف بالكعبة لا تخاف إلا الله." Uday said, "I have seen myself." A woman from Al Hira until she made tawaf around the Kaaba, not fearing anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, he said, La taqumu sa'a, and he mentioned another sign which we're going to do, which we are going to cover later. He said, La taqumu sa'a, hatta yasiru rakiba bayna al Iraqi wa Makkati, la yakhafu illa dolal al tariq. Rawahu Ahmad. The Prophet he said, The hour will not be established until the traveler will go from Iraq to Mecca, having no fear of anyone or anything except getting lost. So that concludes this point of the spread of peace. The, that and true and complete peace is going to happen in the time of Isa alayhi salam when he comes back and in the time of Al-Mahdi. The next minor sign, the appearance of a fire in the Arabian Peninsula. عن أبي هريرة أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا تقوم الساعة حتى تخرج نار من أرض الحجاز تضيء أعناق الإبل ببصرة رواه مسلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said the hour will not be established until a fire will come out of the land of Hijaz that will throw a light on the necks of the camels of بصرة. Where is بصرة? In Syria. In a sham. So this light or this fire is going to come from Al Hijaz, from the, Arabian, from the Arabian Peninsula, and the light of it will be seen on the necks of camels in the land of Syria. And this occurred when a volcano erupted in the time of An Nawawi. He wrote in 654 Hijri. A big fire came out in Al Madina. And Ibn Kathir says in his book, the Bedouins were able to see the spark of light in Busra on their camels. And Ibn Hajar, he says, we think that this incident of this volcano that happened in Medina was the one that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was talking about. And it was discussed by Qurtabi and other scholars, Wallahu A'lam. <clears throat> Anybody hear Turkish by any chance? We got one over here. <laughs> the next minor sign, I brought that up for a reason. The next minor sign, war with the Turks. An Abi Huraira. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا تقوم الساعة حتى تقاتل قوما نهالهم الشعر وحتى تقاتل الترك صغار الأعين 
حمر الوجوه ذلف الأنوف كأن وجوههم المجان المتطرق The Prophet, the Prophet وسلم, said on the authority of Abu Huraira He said the hour will not be established until you fight a people whose shoes are made of hair and you will fight the Turks people with small eyes round red faces and flat noses their faces will look like shields coated with leather now when you look at this description this description does not re reflect the description of the Turks of today the people of Turkey they immigrated from Turkaman and that's an extension of tribes of pe and people that go all the way back to China all right this description that the Prophet Sallallahu gave it fits the description of a people whom the Muslims fought who came from the Far East and it particularly with the Mongols who invaded Muslim lands and they caused so much destruction the the Mongols they were under the leadership of Genghis Khan and Taymur Lang and they went into Eastern Europe and Russia and they destroyed everything at that time they whatever path and lands they came across they just destroyed it and when they completed uh, Eastern Europe they kept going and they went into Muslim lands and when they made it to Baghdad Baghdad was at the time the center of learning of the world at the time you did not have a printing press so the idea of a person having a book or two in their own house was something rare something special let alone having a library and in al-Baghdad you had a library the Muslims had a library full of original manuscript books and when these Mongols came they destroyed Baghdad they killed two million people and they threw the books into the rivers changing the color of the rivers to black for days to give you an, that gives you an idea of how many books they had how much wealth of knowledge that the Muslims had at the time and to give you an understanding of how many people the Mongols killed from the Muslims I'm going to get a little graphic so I apologize but the Mongols used the skulls of the Muslims to make pyramids out of them that's how many people they killed now even with all of that even though the Mongols were victorious they themselves became Muslims but it took a lot of time for them to understand the deen like even after they became Muslim they still were fighting the Muslims and it took, it took a long time for them to actually to stop and to uh, learn the deen and to comprehend and to live up to the codes of Islam in the hadith continues the Prophet ﷺ said something very very uh, wise that we can apply he said وَتَجِدُونَ مِنْ خَيْرَ النَّاسِ أَشَدُّهُمْ كِرَاهِيَّ لِهَذَا الْأَمْرِ حَتَّى يَدْخُلُ فِيهِ وَالنَّاسُ مَعَادٍ خِيَارُهُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّ خِيَارُهُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ he said that you will find from the best of people firm with hatred against this matter against Islam until they enter it the best of you in ignorance are the best of you in Islam so if you see someone who is a staunch opponent of Islam they are going out of their way to ridicule Islam to expose Islam to debate Islam can you imagine how much of a valuable asset this person will be if they come into Islam and you will find that in every stance that they mocked Islam and attacked Islam they will gladly and happily defend Islam because the material of the person is the same 
But when they are on the right team, right? It's like a football player that is on one team or put them on the other. The same skills are going to be used in the game. But you want one team to win. So if the, if the player is on the team that you, the, against you, then you're not going to be happy about him being there. <laughs> you're going to try to win him over. And the moment that they're playing on your team, they're going to make you win. They're going to be a valuable asset. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, during the time when, uh, in Mecca, when Muslims were being persecuted left and right, he said, Ya oh Allah, guide one of these two Umars whom you love more, either Amr ibn Hisham or Umar ibn Khattab. Amr ibn Hisham was whom? He was Abu Jahl. He was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide one of these two Umars whom he favors. Umar radiallahu an, although a young man, was a staunch opponent of Islam. And yet when he became Muslim, the direction of Islam turned. It was him and Hamza that became Muslim three days before. Islam before their, before their Islam was very difficult. But at least when they became Muslim, the, the Muslims could now breathe a little bit. And they weren't persecuted as hard. But persecution became harder and harder uh, later on. But at least they had with them Hamza and Omar. This description in this hadith, it also fits the description of the Ottomans. The Turkish people who immigrated from Central Asian area, they, they immigrated from the Central Asian area into the land of Turkey, which at the time, at the time was ruled by Byzantium. And they were a small tribe of Turks. They went and lived in Anatolia. And when they settled there, they began fighting the Romans around them. And slowly but surely, they expanded their territory until they completely destroyed the Byzantium Empire. And they ruled over the Muslim world. And the Ottoman Empire is full of rich Islamic history that produced some of the best and most influential Muslims in our history. And a prime example of that is Sultan Muhammad II, Al-Fatih, the one who uh, led the conquest of Constantinople, which is now today Istanbul. The next minor sign, the loss of trust. An Abi Huraira, radiallahu an, قال, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, إذا ضيعت الأمانة فانتظر الساعة. On the authority of Abu Huraira, who said, the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if trust is lost, then wait for the hour. He said, what do you mean by the loss of trust? He's asking, how will trust be lost? <clears throat> he said, when authority is given to those who do not deserve it. And that is when trust will be lost. So wait for the hour. And this hadith is narrated in Bukhari. There is another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you appoint someone in a position of leadership and you know that there is a Muslim who can do a better job, meaning that this person has better deen and has better management skills, if you have not appointed that other person, then you have cheated the Muslims. So, leadership is a trust. And the wrong people are leaders. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. So, if you have the capacity to appoint a good leader or a better leader, then you have to do so. It is your Islamic obligation. And if the minimum at the minimum, what you can do is vote, then by all means you need to vote. It is your obligation to voice your concern at the ballot box, to put in your vote. 
The next minor sign, knowledge will subside and ignorance will prevail. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أشاط الساعة أن يرفع العلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said from the signs of the hour that knowledge will be taken away. How does this happen? Do people one day wake up and forget what they learned? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told us how this is going to happen. He said Allah does not take away knowledge from a people, but He takes it away. by the death of religious learned men. Until no religious learned men remains, and people will take as their leaders ignorant persons, people who do not know, people who do not study, people who are not qualified, these people are put into leadership positions. Who when they are consulted, they will give a verdict, they will give a ruling without any knowledge. So they will go astray and they will lead people astray. Subhanallah, in today's climate, in today's society, in today's world, people without knowledge, they are given the title Shaykh, Mawlana, Mufti. And the most famous of these are Shaykh Google, Mawlana Wikipedia, Imam YouTube, These guys, they have the answer, man. Anytime you have a question, just... Ah, there's the answer. Subhanallah, where's the vetting process? Where's the, where's the process of checking to make sure that this is true? Making sure that this is not fabricated? Checking the, the authenticity level of, of any given hadith? Subhanallah, where did all that go? And alhamdulillah myself, I am, and I, by no means am I a scholar. I am letting you know now. Don't call me Shaykh, don't call me Mufti, don't call me, don't call me any of these things. I am your brother in Islam. Now, but alhamdulillah, I have had the privilege of being surrounded by people who took the time to study and learn and get the proper Islamic knowledge. And I have heard them say that many people have come to them with their problems. And I'm talking disastrous problems related to family and money and business. And I mean, their lives were ruined because somebody who called himself an imam or sheikh gave a fatwa and... He, and, he, and he ruined that family's life. Knowledge is a trust. Having this knowledge is an even bigger trust. Because if you have the knowledge, then you are required, you are accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak the truth when falsehood is popular. And on the other side of the same coin, that if you don't have the knowledge, you need to keep your mouth shut. Compare this attitude to how the Sahaba uh, they used to handle this situation when, they, when people used to come to them asking for a ruling. The Sahaba they used to run away from giving a fatwa. You know why? Because they would be responsible for it. And they had a real fear of being accountable on Judgment Day in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything that they said. One of the tabi'een who met the Sahaba, did not meet the Prophet sallallahu one of the tabi'een, he asked 30 Sahaba the same question. And every one of the Sahaba, they told him, go ask the other one. Go ask the other Sahabi. He is a Sahabi too, go ask him. They didn't want to answer because it's a big responsibility. One time Umar radiallahu anhu, he was asked a question, a hypothetical question, and the man who was asking, he said, he, the, uh, he was saying that, you know, he was asking the question and Umar asked him, did it happen? Did this, what you're asking, did it happen? And the man said no, so Umar said, then go back. When it happens, come back and ask the question and I will gather for you 
those who witnessed Badr, not just anybody, the cream of the crop. I'm going to bring together the people who witnessed Badr and we are going to have Shura. We will have counsel and then we will give you an answer. I mean, coming up with an answer is not, I mean, it's not something easy. This is something very, very serious. Nowadays, we ask theoretical questions and we ask questions that have no basis in reality. We need to ask questions that are relevant and we need to ask the right questions. We need to ask questions that have practical use. And for those of us who may have some knowledge, we need to be careful to not answer just any question haphazardly. Right? We answer questions even if the question was not asked to us. Because we want to show that we have the knowledge. We want to show that we have the answer. We volunteer our answers. One time a man came from Al Maghrib, from Morocco. And he went all the way to Medina to visit with Imam Malik. You know who Imam Malik is? He is one of the four Imams. The four, madah, the, four made, the four major madahib. You have Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Al Shafi'i, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. This is Imam Malik, is one of the great scholars of our Ummah. A man traveled from Morocco all the way to Medina to meet with him to ask him 40 questions. And for 36 out of 40 questions, Imam Malik answered, Allahu A'lam. Meaning, Allah knows best, I don't know. This man said, Imam Malik, I traveled from Morocco to ask you these questions and you didn't answer most of them. What am I supposed to tell my people when I go back? His answer was, tell your people, Imam Malik says, I don't know. He was serious. He was not about to make up an answer to satisfy this itch that this person had that I need the answer. Imam Malik knew the responsibility of giving an answer. There was a, the story of a few Sahaba who were outside of Medina and one of them was wounded. He had an injury in his head and he and while, and while the Muslims were camping, they went to sleep. And when they woke up, this Sahabi who was injured, he had a wet dream. He was in a state of Janaba. And he obviously needed to pray Fajr. But before he do that, he had to, to perform ghusl. He had to, you know, do a, a complete shower. But that would mean putting water on his injury. So he asked the few that were with him. They said, what do you think? I mean, should I still perform ghusl? You know, I, I could hurt myself. And they thought about it and they said, you know, we can't think of an excuse for you. Maybe, you know, you should perform complete, a complete ghusl. And so he removed the bandage and performed ghusl. And we can extrapolate from this incident that the water made contact with the open wound to his head. And shortly after that, the, the Sahabi died from that injury. Word got back to the Prophet Wasallam, and to show you the magnitude of this issue of giving a fatwa without knowing the, the right answer. Rahmatun lil alameen. The one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He is the mercy to all the worlds. He said, قَاتَلُوهُ قَاتَلَهُمُ الله. They killed him, may Allah kill them. And he continued to say, Why don't they ask if they don't know? The cure for not knowing is asking. SubhanAllah, there is no taboo question in Islam. And we live in the information age where we feel the need to know all the answers. There is no shame in asking questions. 
but we should ask the right questions when we have them and more importantly we should ask the right questions to those who are qualified to answer that question and the Prophet Sallallahu he also told us that knowledge will erode because no one will ask the Prophet ﷺ said, Islam will erode like the marks on your clothes would erode or wash away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take all of the Quran from the earth and there will not be one verse left. The Prophet ﷺ said that nothing will remain. Fasting, Prayer, zakah, sadaqah, all this will be taken away. وَيَبْقَى طَوَائِفُ مِنَ النَّاسِ الشَّيْخِ الْكَبِيرِ وَالْعَجُوزُ الْكَبِيرَةِ يَقُولُونَ أَدْرَكْنَا أَبَاءَنَا عَلَى هَذِهِ الْكَلِمَةِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَنَحْنُ نَقُولَهَا And there will be people left, old men and old women. Who will say, we used to hear our forefathers say, there is no God but God, and we're saying it now. One of my friends was at the airport at Fajr time, and his flight hadn't taken off yet, and it was time for Fajr, and he couldn't find a chapel nearby, so he decided to pray right there by the gate. So he's praying at the airport, and somebody stops and starts watching him. And after he finished, this man comes to my friend and he tells him, you know, my grandfather used to do that. And my friend asked him, well, that's great. What about you? He said, you know, I believe there, you know, la ilaha illallah, yeah, but that's it. So we're beginning to see the realization of this hadith. What will la ilaha illallah do for us? Sula was a tabi'i studying under the Sahabi Hudayfa. And when he heard this hadith, he asked, فَمَا تَغْنَى عَنْهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ He asked, what is this going to do when they don't know anything about prayer or fasting or hajj or or sadaqa, what is it going to do for them? Hudayfa didn't want to ask, he didn't want to answer. He said, uh, the hadith continues, he said, فَعَارَضْ عَنْهُ حُدَيْفَ فَرَدَدْهَا عَلَيْهِ ثَلَاثًا كُلُّ ذَلِكَ يَعْرُضْ عَنْهُ حُدَيْفَ The Hudayfa turned away from him and he asked the question again and again, three times. Until Hudayfa kept turning away from him. ثُمَّ أَقْبَلَ عَلَيْهِ فِي الثَّالِثَةَ فَقَالَ يَا صِلَى تُنْجِيهِمْ مِنَ النَّارِ On the third time, Hudayfa turned to Sula and said, Sula, this phrase, لا إله إلا الله, is going to save them from Jahannam. It is going to save them from hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would insha'Allah, he would excuse these people because of their ignorance. They did not have the opportunity to seek the knowledge and therefore they would have the excuse of ignorance. Today, we don't have that scenario. You can Google Islam and you will get there. You will find the right answers or at least you will get to somewhere, get somewhere that will tell you in Islam you need to pray five times a day this is how you pray this is how you fast this is how you pay zakah this is how you do hajj the minimum is out there it is a click away the masajid are plenty come to the masjid and ask the imam if they're qualified to answer those questions the, the information is readily available another hadith the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى لا يقال في الأرض الله الله The Prophet ﷺ, he said, that the hour will not be established until the name of Allah is no longer said on earth. SubhanAllah, when, so, when we see someone doing something wrong, the natural thing for us to tell them is, اتق الله 
fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or at least mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when this happens, then the person who's listening, they remember, oh yeah, remember, that's right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forbade this. So you remember, right? This situation that the Prophet here describing that the name of Allah is no longer mentioned. That is going to happen before the end of this world. And this could also literally be the meaning where no one mentions God. Right? When we li we're living right now in a time when people, they feel shy to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not talking about just Muslims, by the way. When we are seeing the corruptions that are happening in our society, different religious groups, they come out and stand firmly against those positions, those other groups that are doing wrong. But because you're fighting it in a secular environment, it's, it becomes, it's uh, bringing up God, bringing up Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it does not, it's not valid in the argument. That's what we have come to as a society. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يأخذ الله شريطته من أهل من أهل الأرض فيبقى فيبقى عجاج لا يعرفه لا لا يعرفون معروفة ولا ينكرون منكرا. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the hour will not be established until Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will take all of the righteous people away from the face of the earth, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will take their souls, and the people that remain will not prevent evil. And, and will not do good. They will only do what is evil. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he said, in this time, all of the Qur'an will have been taken away from the earth. It will not be in the hearts of people. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take it away to the extent that not a single ayah will remain in the hearts of people and not one letter will remain in the Mus'haf because the people are so bad and so evil that they do not deserve it. And that is how knowledge will be, sub, will be elevated and ignorance will prevail. The next minor sign of Judgment Day is وَيُشْرَبَ الْخَمْرِ Intoxicants will be consumed. And I say intoxicants, not just alcohol, because khamr means anything that is going to uh, that anything that troubles the way that you normally think and normally operate, basically. And it particularly is, it fits in this context of, of the size of society that we live in, where uh, it's not just alcohol, it's also drugs. In today's climate, it is considered normal and even cool to drink. Right? There are many different kinds of drinks. There's beer, there's wine, and some are and different, uh, different kinds of beer, different brands of, of different alcohols. They, uh, you know, they, it's, it's kind of like wearing a, a, a certain brand of t-shirt or jeans, right? They give, you, they give, they give away uh, your class, your level of certification. Right? That's, that's, that's how much alcohol is integrated into our society. It is considered normal in our society to drink after work. You know, after you finish work, five o'clock, six o'clock, you punch out and you go to the bar. Right? This is considered normal in our society. If you go to a party in our society, the, the alcohol that is there is the main ingredient of that party. People, they feel that they need alcohol in their system to lighten up, to let loose, to do things that they would not normally do if they were sober. It is called the social lubricant. It is the, the thing that makes them do, you know, make them wild and free. It's called, another name for, for drinking or for, for, the, for drinks is called spirits, right? That's, that's what it's called. And uh, everyone, subhanAllah, even in the society, even with all of that, everyone knows that drinking is bad for you. Everyone knows that. And yet, 
I'm going to zoom out from the individual level now. I'm going to go to how it affects society. If you drink behind closed doors, that's your business. It's not right, but it's still your business. But when you are drinking and you get behind the wheel and you start driving, drunk driving, more often than not, you're going to hurt somebody, maybe even kill them. And so many hundreds of thousands of people have been the victim of drunken driving. I mean, this is a disaster that is happening in our society that needs to be addressed. People kill while they're driving behind the wheel, while they're under the influence of alcohol. Now, instead of stopping alcohol, instead of stopping the consumption or the sale of alcohol, the law states that you cannot operate a motor vehicle under the influence. It says that you can still drink in your home or you can drink in a bar or in a restaurant as long as not, as not in public. But the odd thing is that they advertise for alcohol publicly. It's on the billboards, it's on buses, it's in commercials, it's in magazine ads, it's everywhere. So it's being pushed in our society everywhere we look. It's considered normal. It's very much accepted in our society. And it's not just alcohol, it's also drugs. Marijuana, weed, heroin, cocaine, reefer, ice, all these different illegal drugs, although they may be illegal in the eyes of the law, they are still being consumed, they're still being taken by the people living in our society. And this is a real problem. You know, we mentioned in the beginning of this lecture series how uh, the U.S. passed the prohibition law pro prohibiting the sale and consumption of alcohol. And after only four years, the law was reversed because the people felt they could not live without it. And it caused a lot more harm than it did good to forbid the law. That's how much uh, damage forbidding the sale and consumption of alcohol did in our society. The people were not ready to drop it, even though they know it is bad for them. Let's not just look at the non-Muslims, let's also look at ourselves. How many of us know someone who is Muslim that drinks, that has done drugs or is doing drugs? There was a study that was done by the Journal of Muslim Mental Health risk, that analyzed risk behaviors of Muslim college students on U.S. campuses. 46.2% of Muslim college students have consumed alcohol in the last year. 23.9% have used an illicit drug in the last year. And 37.3% have smoked or done hookah or shisha in the last year as well. Let's leave co consuming alcohol for just a minute. What about those benefiting from alcohol? Let's say you never drank a drop of your, in your life or <coughs> done any drugs in your life, but you yourself are a drug dealer or you sell alcohol in your convenience store. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say about this? قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الْخَمْرِ وَشَارِبِهَا وَسَاقِيهَا وَمَبَتَاعِهَا وَبَائِعَهَا وَعَاصِرَهَا وَمَعْتَصِرَهَا وَحَامِلَهَا وَالْمَحْمُولَ إِلَيْهِ He said, Allah has cursed khamr, alcohol and drugs. He's cursed it. He didn't stop there. So it's not just he cursed alcohol and drugs. He also cursed the one who drinks it or consumes it. The one who pours it for others. The server, the waiter, the bartender. The one who presents it. I don't know for drugs, I don't know what they call that person. The one who sells it. 
If you're at the cash register, if you are the store owner, okay, you're the one working for it. The one who buys it, follow the money trail, right? In journalism school, reporters are taught if you want to find how crime and who's behind a crime, follow the money trail. And that's what this hadith essentially does. It's not so the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who makes it, the one who manufactures it, the one who makes it in their in the factory, and the one who you know you, you have it in the chemical lab for drugs. The one who it is made for, the one who put the order in, the one who carries it. I'm just a truck driver. What kind of truck drive? What kind of trucks do you drive? I drive for an alcohol company. I transport it. Yeah, supplies to you. And the and the one who it is carried to, the recipient of whoever is being sent to. And the one who consumes the money from its sale. And if anyone tries to come up with any excuse, saying, I am just trying to make a living, I am just trying to make money for my family, all I have to say is, Sadaqa Rasulullah. The Prophet وسلم, spoke the truth. I had a couple of friends in college. I had heard about this hadith, but I could not find it. But I, but I didn't have it with me. And when I, when I found out that they were servers, they were waiters at a restaurant that served alcohol. And we sat in the halaqa together in, in college. And when I heard this hadith, I went and dug it up. I found this authenticity. And I said, bros, here's this hadith. They read the hadith. They put in their two weeks notice next day. And that's it, they were done. And since that time, we've been, we've worked, we're actually very good at work, we keep in touch, and we're very good friends today. And they are very adamant that the, the work that they are doing is halal. They make sure that whatever field they get into, whatever work they're doing, that the business is halal. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله ولكم فاستغفروا لتوب المستغفرين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا الحق وتواصلوا الصبر وأخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة